YouTube, and welcome back once again to Zaludadil, Future Lanterns. Now this is right after we had left off last time, I still have not yet unpaused the game. Now I had said at the end of last episode that we're going to be adding a bunch of animal men to the fortress this episode. But first I think we should deal with this strange mood dwarf over here. He had just had a strange mood and I think we should resolve this first. Just because I don't know how retiring the fortress would affect that, I don't want to kill him because of it. So let's see what he does. Rith Pride Baron M. Koldodak has claimed a mason's workshop. Good luck buddy. Give us a good first artifact. Oh and of course he's taking some damn stone. Please don't take much more of that. Oh, and he's heading back up and grabbing some more stone. Fantastic, great. Good, no, that's a good thing. This better be a damn good artifact, dude. All right, he has returned that, and now he needs something else that we do not have here. Yep, it's looking like he needs some leather. All right, so we gotta get our hands on some of that real quick. So I'm gonna build some workshops over here, just like that. And we're gonna have to butcher an animal. How about some horse leather? Sounds good to me. There we go, and Rith the Pride Baron has begun a mysterious construction. Fantastic. While he does that, I think I'm going to start adding another layer onto this storage silo here. And just for the heck of it. Ah, there we have it. That was quick. Rith, the Pride Baron, M. Koldodak, the miner, has created Mubanal, a diorite grate. Let's have a look. Mubanal. Practice tongue. This is a diorite grate. All craft dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is encircled with bands of oval diorite capicons. This object menaces with spikes of diorite and horse leather. Well, you know, it's, it's a grate. Not a great great, but I guess it is our first artifact, so we have to give it some respect, right? Fantastic work. Now throw it in the pile and get back to work. All right, well, we've done nothing with the storage silo, and before I do anything with that, I'm going to introduce us to some new friends. Let's go figure out who they are, eh? Now, this is first going to require me to retire the fortress for the time being, okay? Kind of a scary thing, but yes, we're going to retire the fortress. Your fortress has settled into the rhythm of day-to-day -day living beyond your meticulous concern. So now Zaludadil is out of our hands. Now then, we will start playing Adventurer Mode. Alrighty, and now a tribe of animal people. Intelligent wilderness creature. And you know their status, I'm gonna set them as peasants. We don't want them to be too strong. I think peasant is probably where they should be. And we have a whole lot of creatures here to pick from. Now I'd really like to choose one at complete random, but it wouldn't make a lot of sense for there to be penguin people out in this pine forest here. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna roll dice, one second, 40 options here, and now I'll use my Dungeons and Dragons dice to choose which one we have. All right, 29, Osprey Men. Very interesting, very, very interesting. I was really hoping for like Possum Men or something like that, but this could be cool. I'm gonna work with this, I will respect the dice. Osprey Men, but how many of them? That is another thing here, and so I will Again, turn to the dice. I have a D12 here, and for you non-roll players, that's a 12-sided dice. I'm gonna give this a roll, and whatever number comes up, that's how many Osprey people we're gonna have in our fortress. 11. 11 Osprey people. Alrighty then. Um, well, I guess I forgot about this whole part here. What should I put their points into? I guess I should make it kind of random, huh? Although they do have a ton of points to assign. Well, I would hate to leave their attributes as is and then just throw them in the fortress. I've got a feeling they're going to be kind of frail if I do that. Eh, what the hell, I'll just start throwing points all over the place. And then we just have to make sure to start them off in Zaludadil. Okay, so we start off and we are in Fortress Zaludadil. And all we have to do is retire them at this location. There we go. Now we just have to do that ten more times. I'll be right back. <coughs> Greetings, noble dwarves. We are the Osprey Men. We are here to assist you against the goblins that plague this land. We will help you in any way possible. Please, make use of us in any way you see fit. Alright, that's all 11 Osprey people in the fortress. And we are currently back in control of Zaludadil. Just gonna pause it real quick, take a look around. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 Osprey people now. As well as some merchants where the hell did you guys come from that's bizarre huh all right nothing wrong with more dwarves i guess something i had forgotten to mention is that every time you start a new adventurer some time passes i forget how much it's like a couple of weeks or a month or something so right now this is a while after we had played in the fortress last that's why i'm taking such a careful look around no one's dead except that one dwarf still nothing too crazy on the map you never know exactly how this game's gonna work when you try stuff like this but it seems fine for the most part pretty cool all right, so we got a whole bunch of Osprey people now. That's actually incredibly interesting. Uh, up to 35 
individuals in the fortress now. And, uh, huh. Well, I can see we have some Osprey people up on the roof now. And I don't know if they're stuck there. I assume they can fly. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're just, like, perched up there, kind of chilling out or something. I don't know how they're going to act. I'm kind of weirded out by this, honestly. Well, I'm not too concerned about it, I suppose. If they want to sit up there, go straight ahead. I'm curious to see how they act exactly, like how their pathing works and stuff, because they can fly, unlike dwarves. I had given them skills in nothing, pretty much, except for combat. I figured if it's a tribe of people living out here in the forest, then they're probably fairly uncivilized. Most of their skill is going to be going towards fighting and surviving. But that's not the case if they're living in my fortress, damn it. So they're gonna get some jobs. And you know what, I'm actually gonna take a second out here and sort out all of the jobs in the fortress. It's really kind of a mess at the moment, and we need to make sure that stuff's getting done around here. So I'm gonna get this all sorted out, and I'll be right back. Alright, there we have it. I just set up sort of a simple cast system here, with certain professions having certain profession names. And we should be all set now with people doing jobs. We have miners who do everything stone related, carpenters who do everything wood related, artisans who just make crafts, and a whole bunch of others. Also, I turned off hauling on all of my dwarves, so they don't have to waste their time doing that. And I'm giving that job solely to the Osprey people, just because I want to kind of take it easy on them at first, ease them into the civilized life. If they can handle this, then I'll give them more responsibilities, but that's for later. This should get the job done for now. Uh, I also noticed that these merchants here, I can't give any jobs to them. I don't know why the hell that is. They're part of the fortress, yet they accept no task. So I guess they're just gonna sit around eating our food from now on. Not a fantastic thing. Alright, good. We're good to go. Everyone's got a job, and there's plenty of stuff to do. Let's get to it! Uh, I noticed we have a few of these Osprey people up in trees. I mean, I figured they could fly, seeing as how they're bird people. Uh... But maybe I'll cut these trees down, just in case they can't fly, for some reason. I don't know why there'd be so many up in trees. I have this awful feeling it has something to do with their pathing because they can fly. I mean, dwarves can't fly, so maybe the game has trouble figuring out how these bird people should move. Although it is fun to play with the idea that the dwarves only allow the osprey people to move in, on condition that they have their wings clipped. Oh my god. I just watched this one reclimb a tree after we cut it down. Why the hell would that be? YouTube, this is gonna be a gigantic pain in the ass. Oh, and good, the merchants are here. Fantastic. I'm glad they get to see this. Alright, let's watch this osprey person here as this tree gets cut down. Okay, he's just kind of flying in the air here. And that's about it. Just kind of flying. And now he's getting thirsty. Good, good. Alright, I'm thinking maybe these osprey people can't handle the civilized life. That being said, some of them seem to be doing fine. Like, look at this guy here. Kind of walking around, minding his own business, doing his thing. Coming out here, and then gets stuck up in a tree. Oh, and then continues. Yeah, they got something crazy going on with their path in YouTube. Okay, well, lesson learned. If I'm ever going to try this again, don't do it with something that could fly. Well, I guess the thing I should do is start building little safety ramps all over the place, just so the Osprey people can get down from places if they're stuck. Which seems absolutely ridiculous. Mostly because it's absolutely ridiculous. But, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? And in the meantime, I'm gonna continue this storage silo upwards, and I'm gonna get those bridges done outside. We need some way to prevent goblins from murdering our asses. Oh my god, we can barely handle ourselves, we have more migrants, fantastic. Let's take a look. Ah, Moses, the Tunneler, the Lairshlid Dwarves, Einod, the Naturalist, very cool, Endok, the Trader, Endok, the Trader. Wait a second, who the hell are you? Huh, I don't know who the hell this guy is. He didn't live at the Lairshlid. Interesting. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of dwarves here. I don't know what the hell their story is. We had two Delarshlid dwarves and a whole bunch of other random dwarves. Up to 41 dwarves now. This is getting crazy, YouTube. I didn't think we'd have this many dwarves. Oh, man. Okay. The first of the Osprey people has been found dehydrated. I, I'm sure up in a tree. Up oh, two of them, actually. Great. Good. No, good. Uh, one of them appears to be dead in this food stockpile here. Down to nine Osprey people now. Alright, we already said that the dwarves forcibly clipped the osprey men's wings before they could live in the fortress. Which, you know, that already meshes pretty well with what we've seen. Most of the osprey people aren't really flying around. But perhaps losing the ability to fly kind of drove these osprey men, uh, insane? And so now they frantically try to climb up trees in order to get that feeling of flight once more? Yeah, I could kind of see that happening. I mean, they're osprey people, they're supposed to be flying through the air, soaring great distances. And now they're stuck in this wooden structure with these dwarves. I don't know. I can't- I can do nothing better than that. Oh, and these stupid Osprey people are dying left and right at this point. No, no, it's good. It's good. This worked out just the way I thought it would. 
Well, the good thing is, is that the rest of the Osprey people seem to be doing fine. Working like normal, I'll, I'll just have to keep an eye on them, I guess. Even with those Osprey people dying off like that, I cannot believe how fast this fortress is growing. I'm gonna have to extend the living quarters out the back of this place here, just like this. And really, I don't even think that's gonna be enough. But luckily, we're doing fine on food and drinks at the moment. However, our defenses? Uh, just nowhere to be seen. We really can't put that off any longer, I guess. You may remember me saying I was gonna build a bunch of those catapult bridges outside the main gates, and then load those up with logs. Yeah, I gotta do that shit. All right, right here, and one over here, and I'll build another right here, and some over at this gate as well. I really hope this works. Hey, I'm seriously so happy that this whole Osprey people thing is working out so well. No, really, I'm totally serious. This is working out absolutely fantastically. They're becoming quite an asset to this fortress. I couldn't be happier. I mean, look at these guys. They're walking around up on top of these walls that we're trying to build. Just kind of stuck. What the hell are you guys doing? Get down, man. Just picture them up there, like, flapping their wings, trying to get up in the air again. Giving praise to the sky gods or something. Oh my god, they're so useless. Alright, YouTube, some time has passed and really nothing too interesting has happened other than constant rescuing of the Osprey people. But here we can see Dakost Okenkikross, the artisan, has been taken by a fey mood. Very interesting. Let's see how this goes. Dakost has claimed a leatherworks, and Dakost has begun a mysterious construction. Fantastic. But anyways, other than that, I finished up two levels of new residences here. Still not as many as we need, but it's a start, I guess. Dakost Okenkikross, the artisan, has created Oolong Ilush, a Kawadi leather backpack. Pretty cool. Let's take a look. This is a Kawadi leather backpack. All craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. On the item is an image of a table cut gem in Kawadi leather. Uh, fairly interesting. Now throw it in the pile and get back to work. Alright, I feel like I've got to regroup a little bit here in this episode. I haven't had much time to even think. We've got a couple artifacts here, a whole bunch of new Osprey people, which, by the way, aren't working out so well. We've got a ton of new migrants, and really no space for them. Luckily, we're still doing alright on food and drinks, but you know an area we're not looking great on? Stone. We need some damn stone, I'll tell you. And why do we need stone? Mechanisms. And why do we need mechanisms? Because we need traps. Why do we need traps? Because those goblins could be knocking at our door any goddamn second. And really, I guess I should be focusing on getting more stone, like, ASAP. But I'm just really quick trying to put a roof up on this residence area over here. Just really quick. It's going to take two seconds. And after that's done, we could focus on stone. Oh, also, as another note, I did tweak our cast system just a tad. Which, that's another thing that we've had to do this episode. The whole cast system thing. Which isn't working out very well either. What with all the new migrants and the dysfunctional Osprey folk. Uh, I've recasted all these Osprey people as farmers. You can see I've given them the title field birds. And their sole purpose now is to tend to these fields inside this nice safe structure here. No more going outside, no more climbing up walls, any of that sort of shit. They're just going to be nice and safe inside here. They can still see the great blue beyond up through the grates in the ceiling. Which yeah, seems a little cruel, but it's really for their own good. All that fresh air and breeze and shit just kind of gets to them, I think. They get crazy ideas in their head. And really, I'm kind of sick of picking their dehydrated carcasses out of the trees. This is going to work out fine. And as for the rest of the dwarves, I'll get their tasks all sorted out at some point. Not right now, though. I'm kind of sick of dealing with that crap. Right now, we're going to finish up that roof, and then we'll start focusing on getting through the aquifer. All right, we got all the bridges outside done, and they're all actually linked up to a lever as well. We just got to test it out real quick, make sure it all works. I do have them all set as restricted traffic areas, so no dwarves should be walking around on them. I just saw a dwarf walk on one. Good. No, good. Good. Alright, and they're all up. No dwarves were murdered. That's always good. But they seem to be working fine. So now we just gotta put them back down and then we'll start loading those logs up. Let's put 50 logs on each. Seems like a good place to start anyways. You know, I went through all that damn trouble of building these bridges up on the roof so that we could provide our crops with light, but I never opened them up. That being said, the crops underneath seem to be growing absolutely fine. And if I go over this tile here, it says inside light. So there's got to be light getting in from somewhere, right? Even over here in these little residence rooms, they're completely blocked up 100%, no windows or anything. And it says that they're light as well. Huh, well I'm not sure how this light's getting in, but works for me, I suppose. I'm noticing that a lot of these Osprey people are currently starving and don't seem interested in eating. Also, I'm getting a ton of this message here. Uh, cancels give food, no food available. Like, people are trying to feed these Osprey people. I don't know why the hell that would be. But here we have a dwarf whose job is to give food currently. And, uh, I don't know, he just grabbed a lettuce leaf and walked into the meeting hall, now he's on his way. I don't know, man. Seems kind of strange. I think the dwarves have to feed these Osprey people in order for them to eat. Very odd, man. Alright, we can see the dwarves now bringing logs out to one of these bridges, getting it all ready for those goblins. Now, I had said 50 logs, but I think I'm gonna put a considerable amount more than that. I mean, we do have tons of wood out here. Okay, one bridge is all set. 
Next. Oh, lost another goddamn Osprey person. Damn these guys. Yeah, more migrants, YouTube. They're a whole bunch of mystery dwarves again. I don't know where the hell these guys are coming from. Actually, one of them is Zasset, the owl hammer from Delerchalid. That's pretty interesting. Hey, and he's got a wife. Very strange. We're up to 58 dwarves now. Well, you know, I was planning on living on the surface for a while longer, but I don't know if that's even going to be possible. We hardly have enough room as it is, and we keep getting dwarves. So I've got those traps underway. This residence area is complete. I have no excuses. We have to tackle that aquifer. So I'm going to make a little room off the back of this farm area here. Just like this. Nothing too fancy. Get a roof up on that. And that's where we're going to start digging down. Just so it's a nice safe area where we can take our time. All right. We just finished loading up all these bridges with enough logs. So they are good to go. Hopefully. Just going to have to hope that those goblins, when they do show up, they come right up to the main gates in the vicinity of these bridges. That's the only way these things are going to be effective. I really wish we can get our hands on some more stone so we can start making mechanisms for cage traps or something. And so we should start digging down immediately. I just finished up this little structure outside the back of the farm area. We got a nice roof up on that. And so let's start digging down right here, right in the middle. Just like this. All right, digging down, nothing yet. Maybe we won't even run into an aquifer. And here's the aquifer, great. Okay then, <laughs> how to deal with this? I'm not too sure, honestly. So you can see that this level here is where the aquifer is and I can queue up some stairways on it and they will be dug out from what I understand. Yep, but they just immediately fill up with water. Water which I guess comes out of this surrounding dirt. Now I haven't looked up any videos or tutorials or anything on how to get through aquifers, but I'm gonna try something out. I'm gonna start out by digging a channel. Just down here, I'm gonna channel out this whole area, just one level deeper. Oh my goodness, Gesha to the traitor has been taken by a fey mood. Great, good luck. Gesha to the traitor has claimed a craft dwarf workshop. Oh, and Geshad Itastikikrost has begun a mysterious construction. Very cool. Hey now, Leech Breath has given birth to a boy. Fantastic. Uh, on a similar note, we did have another baby pop up at one point, but I didn't receive a notification for it. I don't know why the hell that would be. So we do now have two little babies crawling around the place. We're coming back, baby. All right, the dwarves are still working on channeling down to the aquifer. I'm going to let them do that. And in the meantime, I'm going to start work on a pasture structure over on the western side of this complex. We need a nice safe place for our animals to graze. Hey, we just had another baby. Minka, the untroubled, has given birth to a boy. I never even saw that she was in a relationship. Oh, and go figure, she ended up with Dumat Boulder, that vulgar crude dwarf we met last episode. Well, I'm glad they're happy. Hey, and actually, if you look here, Dumat, who was very broad and muscular, is now fat. <laughs> Getting a little comfy here in Zaludadil, eh? Well, that's fine. Eat up, my friend, you'll be safe here in our forest home. But anywho, awesome, Gesha the Trader has created Kirfaresh Kes Alek, a horse bone buckler. Let's take a look. Merge Creed, the scratch of humor. Bizarre. And incredibly boring. A horse bone buckler encircled with bands of horse bone. Wowee. But still pretty cool. I mean, it is a horse bone buckler after all. Now throw it in the pile and get back to work. All right, I've had my dwarves digging for quite some time and they've reached the bottom of this pit here. And I made sure they widened it out quite a bit so we have some area to work with. Oh my God. Oh, good, good. No, good. Fantastic. Aquati has stolen uh, our artifact. This is the one we just made. The horse bone buckler. The one that was kind of cool. Remember that one? Yeah, we don't have it anymore because it was stolen uh, by Aquati, which is ridiculous. <sighs> well, easy come, easy go, I suppose. Anywho, if you look up here, I've also been building a couple of walkways up in uh, one of the higher levels of this pit area here. And my idea is to build just a solid chunk of wooden walls that we will connect up to a support on the ceiling and then release so that it can fall down into this water and hopefully just uh, block up all the water. And then we can tunnel down through that wood and continue down into the earth. I'm not sure if that's going to work, but I guess we'll find out soon enough, right? It's going to take a little bit, so uh, I'm going to get to work. All right, YouTube, it's taking quite a bit, but we have this enormous chunk of wooden wall all set now. It's connected up by just that one little support, which is in turn connected to a lever. So all it's going to take is for us to pull that lever, and this giant chunk of wall will go falling down the pit into the water, and hopefully solve our problems. Alrighty, so I'm just going to cue this lever up to be pulled. Wait for a dwarf to come on over here. It is pulled. Oh, there we go, YouTube. Game is currently paused, but it looks like it did fall. Let's see. <sighs> Okay, all right, I don't know if anything happened. A dwarf had a baby. That's something I don't care about right now. Uh, oh, 
What the hell? Okay, I guess it didn't work. It looks like it just turned into its component logs. Well, that's pretty lame. Hmm. Well, you know, I've done it in the past, but not with logs. Maybe logs just explode for some reason. Of course, I've never dropped something on top of staircases either. That could have had an effect. Maybe only natural dirt or stone stays formed when it falls like that? No, but that doesn't make sense. I guess I could have made it out of stone, but we don't have much to spare. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I could try it again, but use stone blocks instead. We don't have much, but maybe I could do it on a smaller scale? Eh, what the hell, let's give it a try. Back to the drawing board. Well, on an unrelated note, you can see over here at the side I've made a room for the Osprey people. I noticed they were starting to claim these bedrooms that I had made for the dwarves. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a, a big problem with that. But, you know, it was they were kind of traveling around and getting stuck up in walls and stuff. If I give them just one tiny little room down here, then all they have to do is walk down this hall to the farm and then back to the bedroom to sleep. Keeps them nice and safe. It's probably for the best, really. Plus, they're animal people, so they probably like that, right? Like a little, little comfy little place for them. Plus, I decided to keep the floor in here natural, just like dirt, with some dead grass and stuff. Yeah, they're gonna really like living here, I think. Things are turning out okay. Hey now, YouTube, here's an easy way to get through an aquifer. It has just become winter and all the water froze, including this water down here, so I think I'm just gonna dig through it real quick. Which, eh, it's kind of the lazy way to do it. Plus, it is still a little bit dangerous, but meh, what the hell. We'll just kind of dig like this. And I don't know how deep this aquifer is either. It could just be one level, it could be multiple levels. In any event, we got through the first level just now. Just gonna throw up some walls real quick so the water can't flow back in when spring comes. And we should be good to go. Alrighty, that should do it. I believe we have a nice up down staircase here surrounded by just a thick sheet of ice at the moment But beneath that we have kaolinite and it's not damp kaolinite either So we should just be able to dig straight through it. No problem, but here's the test. We look like we're good Fantastic soon. We make our homes underground like proper dwarves. No more this forest living elf bullshit Hey, we hit some platinum already fantastic man underground is so much better than that damn dirty hellhole up above with its sunlight and its air horse shit finally we could start making some proper mechanisms too and not have to worry so much about wasting them because we will be wasting them uh, quite frivolously all right i've got the game paused right now we reached through the aquifer and now have access to stone so that's a good thing uh, I really feel like we've got to come up with a plan now. Now that I've gotten through the aquifer, I don't really know if I want to live down there, honestly. We've got such a big place going up here, and, you know, while it is a, a bit shameful for a dwarf to be living up in a forest like this, uh, you know, I mean, uh, at least we got to kill a lot of trees while making our home here. That's a plus. <coughs> So I think maybe I'm just going to keep fiddling around up here and see if we can make this a, a valid fortress. I mean, most of our infrastructure at this point is centered on this top structure right now. It'd be kind of a pain in the ass to move it. Yeah, I think we'll stay up in this fortress for a little while longer anyways. Uh, as another note, YouTube, we had a couple of migrant waves that I had cut out. Uh, we're up to 81 dwarves now. Well, dwarves and osprey people, I suppose. That's a lot, just in case you didn't realize that. That's a whole lot, but it's gonna be fine. Yeah, and I suppose I should really start working on that cast system. We currently have 70 idlers, which is horrible. We did finish this pen over on the side here, so that's good to go. All the animals are nice and safe in there. I don't know what these flashing yellow arrows are. I meant to look into that, but I completely forgot, and I don't care right now. But I'm sure it's fine. I know they're not starving. I think we should start turning our attention towards some sort of a mega project. But what, though? What can we do up on the surface here? Well, let's take a look around this area. Um, see if there's anything interesting. We've got some ponds down here, as well as a whole load of trees, but we already knew that. Well, I'll tell you what. Seeing as how this is the first fortress of this rebirth of the Dwarven Empire, maybe we should turn our focus on the invaders. I mean, they're gonna show up at some point, that's why we made those traps. So, uh, I think I'm just gonna start loading cage traps up all over the place. Now that we have access to stone, we can do that. And then when we do get invaded, hopefully we'll get a bunch of captured goblins, and then we'll need somewhere to put them and something to do with them. So maybe a prison or something. I think that'd be kind of cool. A gigantic wooden prison where the goblins will be judged and judged harshly. And we could come up with all kinds of little fun things to do with them. Yes, that sounds quite dwarven, doesn't it? Also, you know, I was thinking maybe we could make a second entrance from the back of this fortress here. Just to open up when the goblins show up. And then just load it up with traps and all kinds of cruel devices. I think that'd be kind of fun. We really do have to focus on killing as many of those green-skinned bastards as we can. Uh, and on top of that, I'm also going to be working on some more residence area. But I'm not going to show you that anymore. It's kind of boring. Alright, let's get to it, dwarves. And osprey people. 
Oh, oh good, Akia has stolen Ilung Ulush. That was the, the artifact we had made there, um, earlier in the episode. If you remember, we had that, the other artifact stolen, um, just, just earlier by that, um, by the Kawadi. So, for those of you keeping track, that's three artifacts that we made this episode, two of which have been stolen already. Good. Alright, maybe we should get those inside. Alright, continue working, dwarves. Alright, you two, I'm looking here, it says the Carpenter Eral Ugash Lolak is fighting, right? Uh, the carpenter grabs Akia by the right lower leg with his right hand. Straightforward. Uh, then Eral, the carpenter, says, I feel pretty good! And then it says the carpenter's lower body takes the full force of the impact, but it is deflected by the carpenter's cape spider silk cloak. Okay. And here we see the carpenter here, uh, just dead. Dead on the ground. Why? I couldn't tell you. But I know that it involves Akia and some sort of impact. I see no Kia anywhere, just by the way. Um... So yeah, that's Dwarf Fortress. Welcome to Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> I love this game. Petitions available. That's pretty neat. Let's take a look. Onget Anvil owned. Wishes to join the future of Beards as a citizen of Future Lanterns. Do you approve this request? Uh, hell yes. I think that's one of the merchants. Approve. Huh. Okay. Well, let's take a look here. Onget? It was one- okay, it was this guy right here. Oh, and look, I, I still can't give him any labors. Fantastic. Gl glad to have you aboard, Onget. I hope you'll continue to be such a valuable asset. This game. Again, I love it. The main got the Untroubled had another child just now. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Although we really need to stop having babies, dwarves. This is getting ridiculous. Rather, I guess it's our goal, but I mean, this is getting ridiculous. We have no place for them all. Oh well. We'll be fine, I'm sure. Oh, hey now, we have another artifact. I didn't go through the whole opening spiel. I figure we've seen enough of that this episode. Mebzuth Nezushatur, the peasant, has created Dastat Dobesh, a Gabro ring. The Sword of Craziness. That's an awesome name. I wish it was a sword. Uh, this is a Gabro ring. It is encrusted with rectangular Gabro cabicons and menaces with spikes of pecan wood. On the item is an image of Gesha entered channels the dwarf in native gold. Huh, kind of plain, but also sort of awesome. Stone and gold. Yeah, I like it. I don't know who Gashad Entered Channels is. We'll have to make sure this one's secure. Let's get that inside right away if it's not already. Actually, it is, so it shouldn't be a problem. Now throw it in the pile and get back to work. All right, I'm going to start putting down some cage traps just because we have enough mechanisms now. I think I'm going to spread them out around the eastern side of the map because that's where I think the goblins are going to be showing up from. Oh, no, you don't. I see you, key bastard. Look at this guy. He's all wounded. He's got a mangled leg. And he's got a ring. I'm sure this is that artifact that we just made. Nope, I'm locking this door. You're not getting out of here, loser. All right, somebody kill this damn parrot, huh? And it's dead. We're gonna have to keep a real good eye on these artifacts, I guess. Oh man, YouTube. Rith the Pride Baron has been found dead dehydrated. I wasn't recording, but I found him down in the aquifer area, just kind of clinging to the wall, badly dehydrated and starving. And I went through the hassle of building a nice staircase for him to try to get back out. I don't know what he was doing down there, but he finally got out, walked up here to the food stockpile, then just dropped dead. That's what we call a damn shame right there. Well, I suppose on that note, we should really start putting some thought into a burial area. That really sucks, huh? Oh, well. Oh, geez. Okay, um, hmm. All right, YouTube, you can see I've been doing a little bit of building here. And, uh, we just managed to make something collapse. A piece of wall has collapsed, uh, right on top of our farm area. And I think it went through these grates onto one of the farm plots. And may have actually even destroyed the plot. Okay, I guess I'm gonna unpause it and see what happened. Okay, let's take a closer look. Oh, this traitor was hit in the mouth and his lip split in gore. Ouch. Oh goodness, this dwarven baby. Appears to have been caught in the carnage. Oh my god, it was Leech Breath's baby. How you doing, little one? Let's take a look. Now, wait a second here, YouTube. Well, it looks like Leech Breath is actually in a relationship with Mallard. I thought, well, wasn't she in a relationship with our expedition leader? Pops? Wonder what happened. I don't know, maybe I just saw it wrong. Yeah, the baby appears to be fine. I swear to god our expedition leader was in a relationship with Leech Breath. Wait a second, it says that... Pops and Leech Breath are lovers, right? Okay, but if I go to Leech Breath here, her husband is Mallard. I didn't know that could happen. All right, so Leech Breath and Pops are kind of a, uh, you know, a little, little hanky-panky on the side here behind Mallard's back. That is a spicy scandal right there, YouTube. I've never seen anything like that before in this game. Things certainly are heating up here in Zaludadil, folks. Uh, let me know in the comments if any of you guys have ever seen that before. I've never even heard of that happening. Alright, well I suppose while I got you here, I'll go over what I've done in the past couple hours. If we look up to the north of our fortress here, I've created quite a large 
area here. Now then, uh, this is a big old path that is entered from over here. I intend for goblins to come over here, hit this ramp, then go up here and continue down this path here past all these cage traps that are now set up. Then continue down this hall over here to this staircase, go down and then continue on this way all the way through this tunnel to this door right here. So when I get invaded by goblins, I'm going to close up the front gates and they'll be forced to take that path to get into our fortress and hopefully get caught in those cage traps and any other sort of nasty traps I come up with. I'm just going to cram them all in there and just make hell for those goblins. I finished up a new level of our residence area. Things are looking good there. The fortress is getting taller and taller every day. And over here you can see the storage silos coming right along. That's getting taller as well. Six levels tall currently. And if you look here, we have a bunch of cage traps here filled with wild boars. And we've been busy training those things too. Eventually we'll make them tame and they'll be able to just run around the fortress. We could butcher them up. Wild boars are actually really great to have because you don't need a pasture for them. So you don't gotta worry about them starving or anything like that. They're just great. No new artifacts, no trouble from the goblins whatsoever. And uh, oh yeah, right, uh, we're up to 116 dwarves now, YouTube. This is episode two, mind you. That is goddamn wacky. I've gotten many, many migrant waves at this point, and only few of the dwarves have come from Delarshalid, really. So many of them are just, uh, mystery dwarves. I don't know where the hell they came from. Just wandered in from the wilds, scattered remnants of this dwarven empire. It's pretty cool, really. And yeah, I guess that's uh, pretty much it. Well, actually, I did start uh, a large prison area as well up on the roof, but uh, I'm going to show that off next episode. There's really not much to show you at this point. I'll let it get a little bit farther, and, uh, you know, it's something to look forward to next episode, I guess. Soon we'll have hundreds of goblins locked up in our wooden prison. But what to do with them? I guess we'll have to figure that out, huh? Oh, also, as a note, I went in and changed my dwarf population cap to uh, 200. Just for the hell of it, bring them all in, we'll let all the dwarves in, we're not going to open up the caves or anything, so we don't have to worry with that lag. So, the lag shouldn't be as bad as it was in Delirishalid, I don't think, but I guess we'll see soon enough. Well, YouTube, thank you for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you'll join me next time, back here in Fortress Zaludadil. And until then, YouTube.